<laughs> Did you have a nickname growing up? Or maybe you even have a nickname still today. You know, some nicknames are cool, they're powerful. Others, not so much. If you're known as Goofy, not really a great nickname to be known by. If you're known as something like The Rock, well, that's a little bit better. A nickname can be a term of friendship, it can be one of respect, or it can also be rather cruel and taunting. Jesus gave a nickname to two of his disciples, two brothers, and it was not done out of jest, but out of friendship and out of love. And he called James and John, the sons of Zebedee, sons of thunder. Now, thunder is fierce, it is strong, it's aggressive, it's bold, it's loud. From the few accounts we have in the New Testament where James speaks, it's clear that that is a good summary of his character. James was one who was passionate, who was bold, who was aggressive. All good character qualities, if tempered by the grace and love of our Savior, all character qualities that if unchecked in relationship to the Savior can be very destructive. We're continuing this morning in a study we began a few weeks ago, looking closely at each of the 12 apostles. In our study through the Gospel according to Matthew, we've come to chapter 10, where Jesus called the 12 apostles to be his special apostles, those who he would use to be the foundation of the church. Remember Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, we read this. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother. We're looking at what lessons we can learn in particular from life of each of these twelve. We've already looked at Peter, we've already looked at Andrew, so now this morning we come to James. Now, James was a member of the inner three. We've referred to them before when we looked at Peter. Remember, Peter, James, and John were especially close to Jesus from among the twelve. They were given special experiences that were not given to the others. They alone were eyewitnesses to the raising of Jairus' daughter. They alone were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And they were the three that Jesus brought nearest to him in the Garden of Gethsemane. James and John were brothers. They grew up in Galilee. We know they were fishermen. They were blue-collar workers who left the family business to follow Jesus. We also know that their mother was also a devoted follower of Jesus. She was one of the women identified at the foot of the cross during the crucifixion, and she was also one of the women who went to the empty tomb on Sunday morning. And from putting the gospel accounts together, it appears that she was also the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And so that tells us that James and John were actually cousins of Jesus. And despite the important role that clearly James had, he's only recorded as speaking twice in all of the gospel accounts. And both times, it's actually he and his brother John who are said to speak together in unison. And so we're going to look at those two accounts this morning as we seek to learn lessons from James, the son of thunder. So turn with me to Luke chapter 9 as we're going to look at our first lesson this morning. And we learn from James that we ought to have a passion to save others. Luke chapter 9, picking it up. In verse 51, when the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. Now, as we pick up the account here in Luke chapter 9, Jesus and his disciples are traveling from Galilee to Jerusalem. And they were traveling through the area of Samaria. Now, you may or may not know, but Samaria was not known for their great hospitality to the Jews at this point in time. Now, if you remember your Old Testament history, Israel split into two kingdoms after Solomon's death. The northern kingdom, known as Israel, the southern kingdom was Judah. The northern kingdom eventually made its capital in the city of Samaria. And that name came to describe not just that city, but the entire region around it. After the northern kingdom was destroyed by Assyria in 722 B.C., they deported most of the Israelites out of the land, and then they relocated foreigners from elsewhere to live in the land. Those Israelites, the few who were left in the land, intermarried with the foreigners who were brought in, and their descendants became known as the Samaritans, based upon the name of the region. It was a group of mixed bloodline, both of foreigners and Jews. And because of that mixed bloodline, they were despised and looked down upon by those many who were pure-blooded Jews. And over time, the Samaritans even developed their own religious system. They accepted only the first five books of the Old Testament as Scripture, and even then it was their version of the first five books. They worshipped only at Mount Gerizim, which is a mountain just outside of Samaria. And over the years, there developed a deep distrust and hatred between Samaritan and Jews. 
In fact, when Nehemiah came to rebuild Jerusalem, it was the Samaritans who opposed him. And the Samaritans eventually built their own temple on Mount Gerizim, which was later destroyed by the Jews. And so you can see there was hatred and animosity between the two groups that had been developed over centuries. The two groups tolerated each other. They lived in the same region, but they tried to have as little interaction as possible with each other. So that sets the setting for many accounts in the gospel. And that is the area in which Jesus and his disciples were traveling through at this time period. And Jesus sent his disciples ahead to find a place to stay for the night. Verse 53. But they did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. The Samaritans in this village didn't receive Jesus, we're told, because he was traveling to Jerusalem. And from that, it seems that their rejection isn't connected to his being the Messiah because it doesn't say they did not receive him because he claimed to be Messiah, but rather because they were headed to Jerusalem. Remember, Samaritans believed that worship at Jerusalem was wrong. It was blasphemy. And so these in this particular village were especially hostile towards this group of Jews going to Jerusalem. Now, Josephus ancient Jewish historian records that a few years after the death of Jesus, there was a small village in Samaria very hostile to Galilean Jews, especially those who were passing through their village heading to Jerusalem. And one day they even murdered a large group of Galileans, and that created an entire large stir, and the Romans got involved, and it was a huge conflict. Now, we don't know which city in particular here was rejecting Jesus. We don't know if it was the exact same city that later murdered so many Galileans. But what we do know from later history is that there were villages without Samaria that were hostile to Galilean Jews, especially those who were on their way to Jerusalem. And so it may have been and likely was one of those hostile villages that were refusing to receive Jesus and his disciples because he was going to Jerusalem. They refused to let him stay the night. The same reason that years later, Samaritans would murder a group of Galileans making the same journey to Jerusalem. Verse 54. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? James and John, sons of thunder, passionate and bold, filled with anger and judgment, are furious at these Samaritans. How dare they not let them spend the night? How dare they refuse lodging to the Messiah, the one who was going to Jerusalem? And so they suggest, Lord, maybe you want us to handle this. You want us to command fire and take care of these people? Now, as we read it, it seems definitely as an overreaction. Where in the world would they ever think they should be calling fire down upon these people? But we need to understand the setting of where this took place. This was Samaria. This was the same area in which the prophet Elijah called down fire from heaven to consume those who tried to attack him over 800 years before. James and John were fully aware of who Jesus was. They knew that they were his apostles. And apparently they figured that if it was okay for Elijah to call down fire in this same region upon men who showed disrespect for the Lord's prophet, well, how much more would it be appropriate for them to do it to those who were showing disrespect to the Messiah. Now, honestly, I understand their anger. I understand the judgment they felt. In fact, most of us have probably felt that way at least once or twice in our life towards some group. We've seen people endorse evil. We've seen people do appalling things. You look at the political scene. You look at the wor world scene. We see those who do evil, those who act in violence towards the innocent. And we think, God, why don't you just wipe them out? Why don't you just send down fire and consume these people? They deserve fire to fall on them, just like happened in the hills of Samaria in the days of Elijah. But that is not the way of our Savior in this age. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. New Testament apostles were not the same as Old Testament prophets. New Testament apostles came not to preach condemnation, not to call down fire from heaven upon those, even if they deserved it, but they were called to preach the gospel, to show love and mercy and grace. Earlier in the same chapter of Luke, Jesus had said this to the twelve as he sent them out. They were told to go out into the various villages and preach the gospel. And they were given specific instructions of what to do if someone rejected them. Luke 9.5. Jesus said, As for those who do not receive you, as you go out from that city, call down fire and consume them. No, that's not what it says. It says, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. 
See, Jesus had already given them very specific instructions what to do if someone rejected them. He said, you go, you preach the gospel, you share it with them, and if they reject you, you just shake the dust off your feet and you go on to the next village. And that's what James and John should have done in response to what these Samaritans were doing. That's what Jesus had told them to do just a little bit before this. But they forgot that. And in their passion, they want to consume the city in fire. Now, James had a passion and a righteous anger, but he was expressing it in the wrong manner. And Jesus responded in the next verse, verse 55. But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. Now, depending upon your translation, it might have some extra information in brackets there, but that's not found in the oldest and most reliable manuscripts of the New Testament. And the best understanding of what Luke wrote is what we see here on the screen. Jesus rebuked these men because he didn't come to bring judgment. So they went on to another village. They allowed those who had rejected him just to be. And there's a powerful lesson here that James and John and the others learned on this day. We are to be passionate for the salvation of the lost. We aren't to rejoice in their condemnation. We're not to pray for their destruction. We're to preach with passion. But if we are rejected, we're called upon to move on to the next group. We're not called to condemn people with fire. That's not what we're supposed to do in this age. And James and John learned this le lesson by the rebuke of Jesus. And we're told after Pentecost, Jane, John in particular came back to the region of Samaria and he preached the gospel and he saw many people saved in Samaria. We don't have record of James traveling back here, but clearly he changed as well because he had a profound impact on the early church. See, passion is good, but it must be channeled in the right direction. It must be seasoned with love and grace and love and grace for even those who reject us or who are our enemies. We are to pray for those who persecute us, as our Lord told us in the Sermon on the Mount. That doesn't mean we skip justice. Those who do evil should be punished by the law, but we don't take the law into our own hands. We don't call down fire from heaven upon anyone. That's not what we're to do. If someone doesn't want to hear the gospel, we go to the next. We're to have a passion for the lost. But what we learn from this is we don't Focus our time on those who don't want to hear. If someone doesn't want to hear, if they reject you, move on to someone else. But sometimes we get stubborn. We get like James. We want to beat salvation into the head of a friend or a family member so that they get it. We want to bring down fire from heaven so that they'll see God's power and they'll change their way, get their attention. But that's not what we're called to do. We're to have a passion for the lost. We're to pray for them. We're to share the truth with them. But if a person like these Samaritans refuse to listen, if they reject us, then we go to the next village. We go on. That's all we can do. We can't force anyone to be saved. And so we have to learn from James to have a passion, not for judgment, but for reaching the lost in love. There's one other account in the life of James that he speaks in. So turn with me, please, over to Mark chapter 10. And here we see another lesson from James, and that is we are to have a passion to serve others. We're picking it up in Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 32. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking on ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were fearful. And again, he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priest and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. And as we pick it up here in Mark chapter 10, Jesus and his disciples were on their, what would be their final trip to Jerusalem. The road was crowded. There were many heading to Jerusalem. And the people who were going there knew who Jesus was. They knew he claimed to be the Messiah. And we're told those who followed were fearful. Most likely they were fearful because they knew there was something going to happen to this trip for Passover in Jerusalem. Jesus had been warning of his impending suffering for some time. The animosity and hatred of the religious leaders were well known to those who were going to Jerusalem. And everyone was clearly aware something was going to happen. And Jesus took his 12 apostles aside and he told them once again what was going to happen in the next few days. They would be traveling to Jerusalem. And when they got there, he would be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes. And they would condemn him to death. And then he would be handed over to the Gentiles for execution. It's a very clear prophetic statement of what would take place when he got there. And Jesus prepared his disciples. He told them exactly what was going to happen. In fact, he gives even further detail in verse 34. It says, They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise again. Jesus was 
crystal clear here. He says he would be handed over, he would be mocked, he would be spit upon, he would be scourged, and then he would be killed, but he would come back to life in three days. We just celebrated the resurrection last Sunday. We looked at that event. We looked the week before at what it was to be scourged. And everything happened exactly like Jesus said here. He told them bit by bit what was going to happen, and it unfolded exactly as he said. Now imagine just for a moment that you were among the twelve as Jesus says this. He tells you, this is going to be our last trip to Jerusalem. I'm going to be beaten, I'm going to be mocked, I'm going to be scourged, I'm going to be killed, and then I'm going to rise in three days. How would you respond if you were one of the twelve on that road? Would you be grief streaken? Would you be joyous that he's going to come back to life? Would you be rather speechless? Would you try to oppose him and say, let's not go then, let's avoid this? What would be the right response to hearing the Lord say, I'm about to suffer and die a horrible death? Well, look at what the sons of thunder said. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. It's not exactly a compassionate response, is it? It's the disciples had just been told by Jesus, I'm going to suffer and die a horrible death. I'm going to be humiliated. I'm going to be scourged. And everyone knew what that meant. And the response of James and his brother is, hey, Jesus, before, before that happens, could you do a favor for us? In other words, before you die, could we ask you for something? Could you do something for us? You know, the callousness of this question is almost unfathomable. They show no concern whatsoever for what Jesus was going to endure. Clearly, they were only thinking of themselves. And they realize if Jesus is about to die, they better ask him for what they want now before it's too late. So they get in this question. Now, according to Matthew's account, their mother was with them, and she spoke up first to ask the question at their prompting. So what we see is this was a very planned family affair, putting all the family pressure on Jesus to get him to answer their question the way they want. But look what they ask. Lord, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. That's kind of an attempt to manipulate Jesus. It's like a child trying to get their parent to promise to do anything before they tell them what it is that they want. They're trying to trap Jesus. Give us a blank check and then we'll tell you what it is we want. Jesus is very patient with his arrogant disciples. Look at his response in verse 36. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And I said to him, Grant that we may sit, one on your right and one on your left, in your glory. This is an incredibly arrogant, self-serving question. They suggest that out of all the people in all the world, in all the ages, they deserve the highest honor in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was about to die. He told them that. And this might be their last chance to secure their future. So they say, Jesus, uh, let us sit on your side, one on your right and one on your left. Now, to their credit, they recognize who Jesus is. He is the Messiah. They believe, clearly, He is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and He will reign over all the earth in glory after His resurrection. But to their discredit, they think they deserve that glory. They apparently think that by being the first to ask Jesus, He will grant their request. It almost is like someone calling shotgun before they get in the car. Maybe if they call it first, Jesus will give them these positions of glory, and they think they can secure it for themselves. Now, in Jewish tradition, sitting on the right and the left hand were incredibly powerful positions when sitting on the side of the one in authority, in the middle, the king. The one on the right hand was considered to be second in command. The one on the left was the one third in command. James and John are good brothers. They're not fighting with each other. Who gets to be second? They apparently don't care about that. They just want to be the ones that are second and third. Verse 38. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? I can, Jesus is so gracious here to their brash request. He could have responded with a rather harsh rebuke. They deserved it. After all, he had rebuked them earlier when they tried to call fire down on the village in Samaria. But here Jesus is patient and he explains, guys, you don't have a clue what it is you're really asking for. To be honored in this way would involve incredible suffering. And it reminds them that he was about to suffer horribly and die himself. And that would come before he ever sat on his throne in glory. And if that was the future of the king, how much more would it be for those who would sit beside him? 
And he uses two illustrations here of the, his suffering. The cup is an Old Testament image used for suffering. To drink the cup was a reference to experience something to the full measure. Uh, to drink a cup until empty is to experience something until there's nothing left. And Jesus would use that illustration again in the garden. Remember when he prayed the Father to remove the cup if it was possible. It's a reference to the physical, the emotional, the spiritual agony that he was about to suffer. Baptism, a baptize, is the Greek word baptizo. It means to immerse or to be submerged. Now, Jesus is not talking about water baptism here. He's using baptism in a figurative sense to refer to being immersed, to being submerged in the suffering that he was about to experience. It's a graphic image, isn't it? He would drink the full cup of suffering. He would be immersed. He would be completely submerged in suffering very soon. And such a degree of suffering and pain James and John could not experience. You think they might have woke up after that. And they respond in verse 39. They said to him, we're able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink you shall drink. And you shall be baptized, baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. They just didn't quite get it. Just like Peter who said, I will never deny you. So they brashly say, hey, we're ready to face anything. They say, we can handle the suffering. Jesus said, you can't handle the suffering I will face. You can't begin to handle what it will cost to sit at my side. They say, yeah, we can. We can do it. We want the glory. We'll, we'll pay the price. And Jesus says, okay. You need to understand, you will drink the cup. You will be baptized as I will be. Now, of course, it would not be to the same degree, but they would suffer and they would pay a price. But Jesus warns, you will pay. You will know heartache and pain. They said they could drink it, and Jesus says, okay, drink it, you will. But he has another word for him in verse 40. But to sit on my right or my left, this is not mine to give, but it's for those for whom it has been prepared. Not exactly what they wanted to hear. Jesus says, I, I can't promise you'll sit beside me because those positions are determined by the choice of the Father. Those positions of honor will be filled by those whom the Father has already prepared him for, who has already chosen to fill those roles. It's not to those who ask for it first. It's not for those who think they deserve it. It's those whom the Father has chosen. And James and his brother learned that selfish ambition, political maneuvering, that has no place in the life of a believer. The positions of glory in the kingdom to come are to the choice of the Father alone. And we aren't to be those who are trying to maneuver and place ourselves in the most powerful position in the life to come, or in this life. And Jesus uses this as a teaching opportunity for all of his disciples. And we see next the lesson that James learned and the need for selfless service among all his disciples. Verse 41. Hearing this, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John. And calling him to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great men exercise authority over them. The other ten were angered at James and John. The reality is they all struggled with arrogance. They all wanted to be great. What's sad as we read this account is none of them seem to be, seem to be too upset about Jesus' impending death. It's when James and John try to secure their own positions and cut them out of the seat of power that they get upset. Because if James and John got these seats, that means they couldn't sit in them themselves. And Jesus called them together to give them an important lesson about what he truly desired in his disciples. And that is, serving Christ is not about selfish ambition. It's about serving others. It was a lesson James and all the disciples needed to hear again. First, Jesus makes an observation about secular leadership. He says, those who are rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. The Greek word that is used there is katakuriao. It means to lord, to dominate completely, to overpower or subdue another. It is a word that describes the actions of a dictator. Someone who rules by oppressing others, by forcing them with violence to do what they want. Now at this time in history, almost every government was ruled in this way. They were ruled by a king or an emperor. Someone who ruled in this fashion. Who subdued those who sat under them by force. And he says, great men exercise authority. And he's basically repeating the same phrase. Exercise authority is the Greek word kata exeusadzo. It means to reign, to have sovereign power over another. It's a word that describes how a king reigns. Sovereign power, making people do whatever you want them to do. Jesus is saying the model of leadership in the world, it's flawed. 
Greatness in the world is often determined by who secures the power, who makes the rules, who can rule using others for their own benefit. That was the same attitude that was being evidenced by the disciples. See, James and John were thinking of future glory in the kingdom. They were trying to attain glory and power by political maneuvering. They were leaning on their family connection here and their closeness to Jesus to try to jockey themselves into a position of power in the future. They were only thinking about themselves. They heard that Jesus was going to die, and their first response is, we've got to secure our position in the future quickly. And the others reflect the same worldly attitude. They're more upset about James and John than they are about Jesus' death. But that's not the heart that is to be among Jesus' disciples. Verse 43, Jesus makes it clear. But it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be a slave of all. Jesus tells his disciples, his followers, this is what I want. You are to be the exact opposite of what James and John just evidenced, the exact opposite of what the world considers to be greatness. His followers are to be servants and slaves to others. That is the path to greatness in the kingdom of heaven. And that's an absolutely mind-blowing concept that goes contrary to everything that is ingrained in us in the world's standards. And we learn that what God's value is is nothing like what the world values. World leaders are often self-serving and dominant and aggressive. They could often be described like sons of thunder, just like James and John. And Jesus says, that's not the way you achieve greatness in my kingdom. In my kingdom, the servants are the great ones. And let's look carefully at what he says here. First, we observe that it's not wrong to seem to be great in the kingdom. Jesus says, whoever wishes to become great. But the key is, how do you define greatness? Do you desire to be great for God's glory, or are you seeking your own? If you desire to be great for His glory, that's a good thing. If you desire to truly please God, that's a good heart, because we should desire to do our best for our King. But there's a difference between seeking to do your best to hear the accolades of the crowds, or simply seeking to do your best to hear, well done, my servant, from the lips of our Lord. The desire to be great in God's kingdom is not the problem in and of itself if you understand that greatness is not what the world defines it as. Greatness is seeking God's glory, not our own. Greatness is following the model Jesus said in serving others. The path to greatness is not what we would expect. It is to be a servant. The first word that Jesus uses there in Greek is diakonos. It means servant, one who attends to the needs of another. It's the same word from which we get our word deacon from. It was a word that was used to refer to those who did manual labor. It described those who did housekeeping chores or landscaping, those who waited and served on tables. To be a servant meant you served others. It meant you were one who met the physical needs of others. Basically, it's a word to describe someone who would do the dirty jobs that many people don't want to do. And Jesus says, my disciples are servants of others. That means we are those who put others ahead of ourselves means we are to be those who do the dirty jobs. That's how greatness is achieved in the kingdom of God. And then Jesus says it again, but this time he uses a different word. He says, whoever wishes to be first shall be a slave of all. And the word that's translated slave there is doulos. It means slave. It means one who is owned by another. Jesus says, you want to be first? You want to have the glory in heaven? Then you need to become a slave to all men in this life. And he uses a term even lower than deaconos. He uses doulos. He says, you need to be like one who is literally the property of someone else. You need to become a lowly slave to all men if you want to please God, if you truly desire greatness in God's kingdom. That must have shocked the disciples, in particular James and John. They were asking for seats of glory. They, deserve, they felt they deserved to be honored as such. And Jesus says the path of greatness... You've got to become a slave to all. That clearly was not on James' mind as he asked the favor of the Lord. But he found out that greatness is not what he thought it was. He learned an important lesson and one we all need to hear, that the path to greatness in God's kingdom is to be a slave of others. We need to be servants. We need to be slaves. Now, what does that look like today? Well, first we need to understand what it does not mean. It does not mean that we are literally the property of someone else. It doesn't mean that we must do anything and everything that anyone we come in contact with asks us to do. We are first and foremost slaves of Jesus Christ. 
and we are obedient to him above all else. We never obey men when that would cause us to disobey Christ. We don't obey men if that would cause us to sin. And Jesus doesn't mean here be a doormat, let others push you around, let them make you do sinful things. That's not what he's talking about. But he does mean that we are to consider ourselves as a slave to others in the way that we seek to serve them, that we would serve others the same way that a slave would serve his master. That means we are to serve others without looking for applause. We do it without seeking the credit or the glory. It means we seek to put other people's needs first ahead of our own. It means we seek to exalt others and that we are quite content to stay out of the limelight in our service of those around us. This is exactly what Jesus described in Luke 17. Listen to what Jesus says in Luke 17, starting in verse 7. Which of you, having a slave plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, Come immediately, sit down to eat. He will not say to him, Prepare something for me to eat, and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you may eat and drink. He does not thank the slave because he did the things which, which he was commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things which you are commanded, you say, we are unworthy slaves. We have, on, we have done only that which we ought to have done. That is how the Lord said we are to respond as we serve one another. We are to serve, not looking for the applause, not looking for accolades, not looking for the glory, not looking for the recognition, not looking to get the plaque on the wall with our name on it. That's not why we serve. We serve because that's how a slave serves his master. At the end of the day, as you reflect upon what you've done in the day past, what goes through your mind? Do you bemoan the fact that what you did went unrecognized by someone? Do you grumble because you're serving someone and they just really don't seem to appreciate it much and they haven't given you very many attaboys and no one seems to thank you for what it is you're doing? If that really is your heart at times, you need to beware that you are acting like James and John were acting. You are acting like the pagans. That is not the way Christ would have you to respond. We are unworthy slaves. We have only done that which we ought to have done and we serve others for God's glory, not the recognition of men. We do our works not for human recognition, but for God's glory. And God sees all, and He knows what we are doing, and that's the one whom we serve. We serve others because we are slaves, and that's what slaves do. It's so easy to fall into the same trap that James and the others did. We can want the glory. We can want the attention. We can want the praise of others. We can even look like a servant, but we're only doing it so that others can tell us how great it is in what we've done. That ought not be the way we serve. We're not to tell others all the good things we've done, waiting for them to sing our praises. We're to serve others, not to help ourselves, but for God's glory, not our own. In fact, that verse in Luke is one we ought to echo every day. It's one we ought to memorize and put into practice and say we are unworthy slaves. We have only done that which we ought to have done. That ought to be every one of our First thought, when, someone, when we get upset that someone isn't recognizing us the way we ought to. Because when you're treated like a slave, remember you are a slave. You are a slave of Jesus Christ, and that's how he called us to serve one another. That's to be our heart's cry. That's what it means to be a slave of all, to be a true servant. That's what Jesus desires of his disciples. And that's a powerful lesson we learn from the Son of Thunder. We are called to be a slave to others. And notice what Jesus follows that up with in verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Since the greatest of all, the Son of Man, the Messiah, the Savior, the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, Jesus, since he came to serve, how much more should we, his followers, serve? Jesus set the example for us. He didn't come as a politician. He didn't come to use others for his own gain. He came to serve. He came to put our needs ahead of his own. So much so that he gave his life as a ransom for us. And that's the model we are to follow in serving others. James and John asked to get seats of glory for themselves. And they learned the lesson that the path to true greatness was to be a servant of all, just as Jesus was. That's our model. And it's a question that we should ask ourselves constantly. Are we serving others as Christ served us? Are we willing to lay down our lives, our pride, lay down our agenda in order to help someone else? Or do we often think we're too good or too important to do something to help another? 
This is what our Lord calls us to do. It's what He modeled. It's what He demands of His disciples. The path that is pleasing to God to being truly great is to be a servant. You know, there's only two accounts in the Scripture where James speaks. These are the two. Clearly, he was a passionate man, one whose passion needed to be channeled correctly, which Jesus did. And Jesus taught him the need to have a passion to save the lost and needed to have a passion to serve others. And apparently he learned those lessons because he became a respected leader in the early church. In fact, so much so that in Acts chapter 12, when Herod wanted to persecute the Christians, he first arrested James and he put him to death with the sword, the first of the apostles to give his life. James was arrested and executed even before Peter was arrested. And James would have never been in such a position unless he had learned these lessons of service and humility well and was recognized as such. And he did drink the cup of suffering and he was baptized with suffering and pain as Jesus warned him. And James will, his name will adorn the foundation stones of the new Jerusalem as a testimony to his service to the king as one of the twelve. Let us apply the lessons from these passages to our lives. We see the Son of Thunder was passionate. That's a great quality. But we've got to remember to be passionate about the right things. We have to be those who have a passion for the lost. Not to see them condemned, but to be saved by Christ. And we have to have a passion to serve others. To be those who truly view ourselves as servants, as slaves to others, all for the glory of Jesus Christ. These are lessons we learn from James. And so let us all serve the Lord with all our heart, mind, and soul, recognizing He is worthy of our service and our devotion. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for these vignettes from the life of James. Reminders of the lessons he learned the hard way that we might learn without struggling quite so much as he did. Help us to learn the need to have a passion for the lost. Not in judgment, but in love and showing the gospel and preaching the gospel to those who are lost. May we be those who are never seeking our own agenda, our own glory, but seeking only for your glory. Help us to develop the hard attitude of a true servant. For we are your slaves. We are the servants of others for your glory. Help us to keep that on the forefront of our mind that when we are treated as a servant, we ought not bristle, we ought not get upset. You have told us that is what we will be treated like. And we ought to rejoice in the fact that we have an opportunity to serve others. May that be our heart cry. Give us a passion for the others. Give us a heart of service. Open our eyes to areas in our life in which we are arrogant and prideful and we are acting like James and John and the others that we might ever be those who are your servants. We thank you and we give you all the praise and all the glory for it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.